can see in some respects we're not traditional. And that is because the house of God doesn't care. What the house of God cares about is order and decency. We don't have to have traditions. And that's just who we are. So we're not putting on any airs. This is who we are. Uh, I allow folk to talk. You know, if you have a question, ask it. Uh, however, I would ask when someone's preaching to just write your questions out and then you can ask them afterwards because it can mess up, you can mess up the flow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, no, I, I, this is not by any way of admonishment. It's just, especially when a preacher is preaching, uh, it's good to find out, if you're not sure, obviously, what, what, sir, what scripture. Yeah, definitely, because you've got to be on the same page. So that's fine. Um, I have here, let's jump right into it for this evening, afternoon. Um, I am, in fact, Pastor Dan Walker. This is New Bethel Baptist Church in Framingham. I'm only saying this for the recording because uh, the, the stream computer is down, but we're recording everything so I can post it later. So, um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your visitors, and we thank you for your spirit. And now that we ask that you hide me behind your cross and let everything I say be in your agreement and with your power and the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 Some of you know and some of you don't know, I've been going through lots of little medical stuff lately and notice I said I'm going through it Amen. because Amen. I'm not... <laughs> and he's off. <laughs> I, I, I don't mind kids running around. That's life. You know, that's life. Back in my day, of course, that wasn't allowed. <laughs> you were put in the chair, and you stayed there, and you were handed some candy. And, well, first... You were given candy, and that didn't work. You were given a hand. <laughs> uh, so I have here, let's jump right into it. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Hey, the first time you did outrageous. That was a fantastic message this morning. I know you had a lot on your heart that you wanted to get out. So we have to let you speak more often so you can, so you don't, it doesn't build up like that, you know. <laughs> we may have to create a segment just for you, so we, <laughs> that was excellent. We're in the middle of a, ser of a series of sermons called From the Pit to the Palace. And I must confess, I was going to tell folk later on, but this series was suggested by Pastor Garrett. Um... And he, he wrote some stuff for me, and I, I read it, and I went, you know what? This is excellent. And so we've gotten, you know, it's probably, from what I'm looking, I've been looking at it, it's probably going to be a series of ten sermons. I don't think I've ever done that before. But right now, we're right in the middle at Sermon 5, From the Pit to the Palace. So we have a quick review for those of us who are just joining us for the first time. Uh, two, three. I know that three and four are up online. I can give you the links for them. Um, the lesson from part one. Learn to keep your mouth shut when God is blessing you until you can make it clear that the blessing is all about God and not about you. The lesson of part two. You are right where God wants you to be either by his permissive or his expressive will. I'll give you a chance to get paper and pen because some of you like to take them. You don't have a pen? We got pens. We got pens. Yeah. Gracias, Donata. <laughs> or obligada speaking Portuguese. <laughs> the, 
the lesson of part three. No, I don't mind repeating it. One, learn to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Not just you. When God gave me that, he slapped me. He didn't just say, Dan, say this politely. He slapped me right upside the head with this one because I've been told that I talk too much by people who actually like me. <laughs> so you know it must be true. <laughs> Learn to keep your mouth shut when God is blessing you until you can make it clear that the blessing is all about God and not about you. The lesson of part two is you're right where God wants you to be, either by his permissive or his express will. The lesson in part three is trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding. Because as God told the prophet Jeremiah, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. The lesson of part four, be patient. God is not through with you yet. So now as we begin part five, we're asking that everybody turn to Genesis chapter 41. See, I'm not going to make the mistake. I'm going to tell you right now where we're going to be. <laughs> we're going to be in Genesis chapter 41. Now, I'm not a, 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 I'm not a um, revisionist. I'm a New King James person, but there are times, and people know this, there are times when the New King James says something, and I don't think it expresses the proper spirit, so I would say it in the King James Version, because there are times when we try to make things too modern, we lose the spirit of what's being said. Okay, so when it's necessary to make sure that spirit gets conveyed, I will use the King James. For clarity, I use the new King James. ASB is good. <laughs> when you have to come to our Bible class, I did, a, I did a class on Bibles. And each Bible, each style of Bible is after a certain pattern. So the ASB is, a, is, is one of those category type patterns. I'll, anyway, yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, I'm prone to squirrels. I have to be very mindful of that. <laughs> Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. That means we're going to go through the whole chapter. But we can start at verse 1. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and he stood by the river. We understand that for two years, Joseph was in charge of the prison. For two years, the baker has forgotten his word to Joseph. For two years, God is watching Joseph to see how he's going to act. We know that Joseph is faithful. Well, how can we know this? Simple. We're not told otherwise. We know that during that period of time, Joseph would have been, when he was started working at, when he was sold into slavery, he would have been about 17. So while he's at, he's in while he's at Potiphar's house, he's in that teenage, early 20s, mid 20s age. So yes, he was young and he was handsome. Truthfully, that, I don't think that was the issue. I just think it was just the concept of a new toy for Potiphar's wife. But Joseph was young and handsome. We know that as this goes on, the story that as we learn about Joseph, we're learning about a gentleman through his entire life. So we keep this in mind. He's in prison now, thanks to Potiphar's wife. 
He's in charge of the prison, and he's been running the prison for two years. The baker promised that when the baker was restored, he was going to tell Pharaoh about Joseph, and he did not do that. And some of us would have said, well, wait a minute. Uh, we would have been on the baker's back. We would have sent word. We would have done something. We would have said, hey, remember you promised this, that, and the other? Joseph never does that. We know that Joseph is faithful. How many of us could be that faithful? See, Joseph was in a state of being watched by God. And I submit to you that you are being watched by God. I have written here as a question, how many of you think you're in a state of being watched by God? Because God has something more for you. You see, you have to understand, the enemy watches you too. And the enemy listens to you. Not because he wants to uh, help you be better, but because he wants to see how he can bring you down. There are times when we should not say everything out loud. There are times when we should make our desires known to the Lord in silent meditation and in prayer because the enemy is a great counterfeiter. And we have to be sure that we're in the right spirit because if the enemy is sending us a blessing, we have to have discernment to understand when the blessing is from God and when the blessing is from the enemy. Because in that, tack, in that fact, it's not a blessing at all. It's actually a curse. And some of us have been cursed by our own desires, by our own requests, by our own thought processes. And the enemy says, yeah, keep thinking that. Remember, the enemy does not want you to have a prosperous life. But the enemy does want your life to be full of stuff. See, there's a difference between being prosperous and having a lot of stuff. And Deacon alluded to it this morning. Just having a ton of money sitting around doing nothing, collecting interest, is not a proper way to use the money. How many cars can you drive at one time? Well, every car I know has only one steering wheel, unless it's a driver education car, in which case it may have two. But in that case, you're not really the driver, so it's not relevant to this conversation. You see, we have to be sure that when we're being blessed because of our faith and because of our prayers, that we are in the right place to get the blessing from God and not the substitute blessing, which is actually a curse, from the enemy. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Let's get the door. Someone's having trying to get that's the baby. Okay, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> then behold, seven other cows came up after them in the river, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. The number seven is very important in God's universe. The number seven is completion and perfection. It also symbolizes God's total will for anything. The number seven is exoneration and healing. And most importantly, the number seven is given as a fulfillment of God's promises and oaths. Back to God's word, verse five. He slept and a second, dreamed a second time. And suddenly seven heads of grain came up and one stalk, plump and good. And behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. 
This is the controversial part. Almost every one of my sermons has a controversial part that gets me into trouble. This is the controversial part. I believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I believe that if he, speak, if he spoke to Pharaoh in a dream, he can speak to you in a dream. I believe that if God put it in the dream and put it in the dream twice, he's trying to tell you something. I believe that if you don't understand the interpretation, then you need to know somebody who is full of the spirit that can interpret the dream for you. And I believe that in today's world of YouTube and Facebook and all of that stuff, don't put your dreams on YouTube and Facebook not what they're for. It's between you and God. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and all of its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was no one that could interpret them for Pharaoh. Why? Why could none of the uh, wise men interpret Pharaoh's dream? This is really simple when you think about it. Pharaoh's wise men and Pharaoh's magicians were loyal to who? Thank you. This was a dream from God. This is why I say don't put your dreams and ambitions on Facebook. Facebook is not loyal to God. I guarantee you the enemy has a Facebook page. Amen. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to need another one. We don't have any more? Okay. Yeah, just fill this back up then or whatever. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. Now, before we get so high and mighty, Before we get so high and mighty, we would all say that what took him so long? But remember, we are not on our own schedule. We're on God's. And the other part of this is each and every one of us is the butler. I'm sorry, is the, ba is the baker. Each and one, every one of us has made a promise to somebody that we were supposed to fulfill and haven't done it. But we get reminded when a situation comes up. And our first response is, oh my goodness, I forgot. So what took him so long? When Pharaoh was angry with his servant and put me in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, this is verse 10, now we're at verse 11, we each had a dream one night. He and I each had dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Let me take a couple of seconds and explain that. Just because you are given a dream, it is for you. Each one of these people Unless God is trying to say something to a mass of people, you're going to dream something in respect to your understanding. Recently, we had a situation where uh, somebody called me with, a, with a, a prophecy, with a dream they couldn't understand. And I, I was able through God, through the Holy Spirit, to tell them the interpretation of the dream. It was, it was quite enlightening because it has to do with the future of New Bethel and how it's going to prosper and flourish and grow. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass just as he had interpreted and so it happened, he restored me to my office and he hanged him, the butler. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and he brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. This part right here is something that is very difficult for me because those of you who don't know my history don't know how hard it's been for me to get where you see now. You look at me now and you go, oh, he's not too bad, Pastor. You know, not, not so bad. 
Patrick's okay. This was a long road getting here. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very long road getting here. Those of you who know, who've known me forever, when I'm out different places, know that I used to go through church in t-shirt and cut off jeans and tennis shoes. <laughs> that, that was just me. Why? Because I didn't understand exactly where I was and the reverence that was required to be where you are. Mmm. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't truly that I began to get a clue and a hint when, when I was in the martial art world. Uh, I'm a person of numerous black belts, and when I go to tournaments and stuff like that, I wear a belt that has my stripes on it to let people know what they are because everybody who's in that world has a belt and they have stripes on that belt to let people know who they are. So it made sense that when I go to a tournament, I go in proper dress. So it makes sense that when I come to the house of God, I come to the house of God in proper dress. Joseph would not go before Pharaoh until he had shaved, cleaned up, and put on proper clothes. And Pharaoh was just a ruler. But Joseph wanted to show proper respect. Someone said to me a long time ago, and I didn't understand it until literally just this year. This was told to me back early days when I was starting to work on stuff. He said, what you do anything is how you do everything. And that didn't make sense to me until literally just recently. When it comes to find out that when you want people to reverence the God that you serve, start reverencing him, him yourself. Start making it evident that you serve a God deserving of reverence. Amen. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard it said that you can, you can understand a dream to interpret it. There's a certain wisdom in how Pharaoh speaks. And this is very important because he says, I understand, I've heard it said. Meaning he didn't say who said it. <laughs> Why? It's not relevant. Sometimes we look for confirmation, we look for uh, approval, we look for accolades for something that is not necessary you will discover, especially in the corporate world, that you can go very far if you don't care who gets the credit. If you just make sure stuff happens in such a way and other people stand up and get the credit for it, eventually in God's time, <laughs> you will be elevated. Now that is counter to every self-help corporate book you'll ever read, but that's true. Stop looking for people to pat you on the back because sometimes they're just trying to find a place to put the knife. <laughs> so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Do you see how Joseph continues to point his Egyptian captors to the true God. We forget sometimes that Joseph is a captor. He is in prison. He is essentially, he has no freedom. But all the time, he's not walking around with his lip poked out. He's not walking around with his pants down around his ankles. He's not whining, oh, poor me, I serve, I, my, where's my God? Joseph is doing what he's supposed to be doing. And in, during, and in that, again, I would ask, are you pointing people to the God who you say you serve? 
And when someone says to you, that's a great job, uh, do you say thank you or do you say to God be the glory? See, that's a, that's a tough one. I find it easy to say to, to God be the glory when it comes to church stuff. But what about when it comes to secular human stuff? You did a fantastic job. Well, to God be the glory. I guarantee you the more you say it, the more you'll believe it. And the more you believe it, the more you'll act on it. And the more you act on it, the more blessings will come your way. Because God's glory wants to show in each and every one of us. We're created for his glory. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. I've got to slow it back down. Verse 17, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in a dream I stood by the banks of a river, and then suddenly seven cows came up out of the river looking fine and fat, and they fed in the meadow, and behold, seven other cows came up uh, after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt. Such ugliness I have never seen in the land of Egypt. And the gaunt, ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. And when they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they'd have eaten them, for they were just as ugly as the beginning. And so I awoke. Hmm. Curious. God is quite explicit and specific when it comes to some of the things he says concerning our prosperity. He says that if you don't understand where it came from, you're not going to understand how to keep it and what to do with it. And if you get a big windfall and you don't know what to, how to handle it, it'll be like having a hole in your pocket. And all of a sudden, it'll be gone. And we know this to be the case because how many stories have we heard about people who have won the lottery and filed bankruptcy within a year? So there's some principles in operation here that we as Christians need to be operating in. Verse 22. Also I saw in my dream and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk full and good and behold, Seven heads withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. And so I told this to the magicians, but there was no one to explain it to me because they're all pagan worshipers, and I need the answer from the one true God. He didn't say that. I'm just paraphrasing. <laughs> because there are times when we need an answer from the one true God. But we keep asking Facebook. I'm dogging Facebook today. I don't know why. <laughs> Dog on. <laughs> and Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Is God showing you what he's about to do? Are you paying attention to that which it is he is showing you? That's a tough one. Because it's one thing for God to show us what to do. It's another to pay attention to it. And this is difficult even for those of us who say we have a calling on our lives. We get a simple inkling. Take your raincoat. And we look outside and all we see is sunshine, rainbows, lollipop. Anyway, that's a different song. <laughs> so we don't do it. We get in the car, we go where we're going, and halfway through there, whoosh. <laughs> and, it, and as soon as that happens, you can tell it was God, because as soon as that happens, your mind says, I should have brought my rain or umbrella, or something. God told me, and I didn't listen. And I will tell you this from, from personal history. If you stop listening to the small voice of God, you may not get another one for a while. 
The seven good years, the seven good cows are seven years. The heads are seven years, the dreams are one. The seven thin and ugly cows which came up for the seven years and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is a thing to which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Stop thinking that God is only giving you a clue. Pharaoh is an Egyptian. Egyptians are polytheistic. Pharaoh does not worship the one true God. Pharaoh worships many gods. However, the important God has gotten through to Pharaoh. Uh-huh. Got a little quiet on that one. That maybe that's a little more metaphysical. Let me make it plain. Even though people could be in sin, even though some you're, you're, you've got kin that are going through issues, they may not be hearing they may be hearing all of the voices, but I guarantee you the word of God is getting through to them. But you have to support that because there's so many voices happening at the same time that they don't know what's going on. That's where you come into play. This thing I have spoken to Pharaoh God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. There's something explained to this to me a long time ago. They said the cheap price will be forgotten if stuff stops working. <laughs> mm-hmm. You have two cars, one costs 150 bucks and one costs 5,000. Unless you're me, you're not gonna you get as far in the 150 as you would with the 5,000 because I can fix stuff. <laughs> but the one with the $5,000 car will just drive it where he's gotta go. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following. It will be very severe and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because this thing is established by God and God will bring it shortly to pass. There are things in your life that God has told you once, has told you twice, and may even told you a third time, and you are still not listening. And then, just to make life interesting, somebody will come up off the street and tell you the same thing. Therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. Do you see what God is saying to his people? One-fifth of all you have should be saved for times of famine. And I have written here, wow. This never occurred to me before. I love new revelations from God as I study his word. Because society will tell you to save one-tenth. But according to what the word of God said, he said save one-fifth. And as we go through the next, and part six, we're going to discover that by Joseph listening to what Pharaoh, by what God says, he's going to have an abundance. And it's kind of interesting to me that if we listen to the world, even when we have what we think is the right amount of savings, something will come up that will mean just a dollar more than what we got saved. It's annoying, but it's just a dollar more. But if we save according to what God said, one-fifth of what we have when we are being prosperous then when the time of famine comes, you'll have an abundance. I never got that until God revealed it to me. And let them gather all the food in the good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Under the authority of Pharaoh means that 
if you touch this grain, you die. Period. <laughs> when I come to collect and you don't give me one-fifth, you die. Period. <laughs> then the food that shall be set as a reserve for the land for seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and that land may not perish during the famine. So many things are happening in this short little chapter concerning Pharaoh's dream. The first thing to keep in mind is that David does not complain, David, Joseph does not complain about why he has not been set free in the two years that he's still in prison falsely. He just does his job. He continues being who he is because he is trusting in God. And notice how the Bible does not make a big deal of saying that. We have to understand sometimes you just have to read what's being said. Joseph is faithful. He knows where he is because he said in part, as he said in part four, I didn't do nothing. I'm a captive. And I'm here. But while he's there, he's not acting like a prisoner. He's not acting downtrodden. He's not acting beaten. He's not acting defeated. He's acting as one who trusts God. Who are we acting like when troubles come up? Are we, oh, woe is me? Do we launch the biggest pity party known to man and invite everybody to come join us? Or do we say, I am a child of God. I have the right to call on the kingdom to help me. I don't have to worry because my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. What are we saying in times of trouble? For two years, Joseph maintains who he is. And then in God's time, in God's time, Pharaoh is given two dreams. And no one can interpret it. Because in Pharaoh's world, there are many gods. But God's word is going to rise above all of that. And it takes a person of God to interpret a word from God. You can have all the degrees and all the letters behind your name, and you can understand the exegete, the isogete. You can know where it came from, how it got there, and who wrote it, why they did it. But without the spirit of God, you don't know nothing when it comes to the word of God. And Joseph is called, and the baker remembers, and the baker repents, and Joseph goes before the king, but he just doesn't go before Pharaoh any old kind of way. He sets himself aside. He shaves. He cleans up. He puts on some decent clothes. There's nobody to impress in the prison, so he can just wander any way he wants to be. But when he has to go before the ruler, he goes correct. I keep telling people there's a reason why whenever I have to go to court, I go in a suit. If I'm going for somebody to be with somebody, why would I go stand next to you trying to give you credibility and I look like who did it and ran? All I'm telling a judge is that this guy has an idiot for a friend. <laughs> so Joseph cleans up, which is important. I, I'm, I'm hammering this because I had to get it into my own head. You got to clean up and look the way you're supposed to look when you go to do something you're supposed to do. What's it look like a baseball player coming out in a soccer uniform? What's he there for? Well, 
which is another thing that God just showed me right now. Thank you, Jesus, which is why we should put on the whole armor of God when we go out to, in the world so that we are wearing what we're supposed to be wearing. So if I'm at the job and somebody's cussing at me, I can say quietly within my spirit, in Jesus' name, I'm only going to hear what I need to hear. Because I've got the whole armor of God on. And nothing they're going to throw at me is going to hurt me. It ain't personal. They don't know me well enough for it to be personal. <laughs> they don't. So now we have Pharaoh dreaming the dream. He needs an answer. We need an answer. So instead of going, he goes to all the magicians just as we do. We go to our friends. What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? There's a great line in a Jackson Brown song that I like called Running on Empty where he says, I look around to all the friends I used to turn to to pull me through. Looking into their eyes, I see they're running too. We have got to stop seeking answers from God without going to God. So Pharaoh goes to who can give him the answer, Joseph. And Joseph does not, this is not, Joseph, this is very important. Joseph does not use this opportunity to plead his case. He doesn't use this opportunity to blame the baker, to tell how Potiphar was wrong for putting him in here. He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He does what he is called to do by God. And he answers by giving God the praise and by telling Pharaoh that he's going to answer the question, but it is not him. It is God giving the answer. And this is what's supposed to happen. And this is what you've got to do. And then he hushes. When you do what God has told you to do, it is time to sit down and shut up. They teach that when you're teaching us how to preach. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit leaves, you shit down and shut up. <laughs> it's important that we have to understand that the information we are given, we're given for a reason. And that reason is not to puff us up. At no time does Joseph act like he's all that and a bag of chips. He said, God will give the interpretation. God will answer the question. God has shown Pharaoh what's going to happen. There's going to be seven years of lean. And during that seven years of lean, you, I'm doing the, uh, the, uh, the seven years of, 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 of um, excess. I can't think of the word. Feast. During that seven years of feast, God is saying you have to share, store, and wait. And God said one-fifth. I find it curious that the world has always told us a tenth. But God said one-fifth. Yeah. Okay. And I thought about it. Give, save more. And when you save more, you're going to be fine in the times of famine. <clears throat> Not any of us would say I'm going to drive to California and only fill the gas tank a quarter way. <laughs> None of us would do that. We'd at least start off with a full tank. <laughs> what we have to do on the way is what we have to do on the way. <laughs> We're going to start off with a full tank. And sometimes when we want to do a work for God, we don't start off with a full tank. We start off halfway or we don't spend enough time in fasting and prayer. We don't spend enough time making sure that the words we're hearing are the words from God and not the words out of our own head. And when sometimes when family and friends call us to ask us for advice, this is our opportunity to finally tell them everything we wanted to say and not what God told us to say. And Joseph 
is a perfect example of how we can be blessed in a situation. And so we come to the lesson of part five. Your gifts will make room for you in God's time, not yours. Amen. Amen. Just a closer one.